My name is Stacy Roberts and I am from the Pachanga Band of Luceno Indians. We are in Fort Worth this morning and this is the ancestral land of the Kickapoo, the Comanche, and the Wichita people. It is so good to be with you friends, even if it is in this way, where we are gathered together though we are apart. I tried this morning to create um, a sacred space where I could preach under my oak tree that's in the backyard that I talk and write so much about, but it's 9 million degrees outside and we live in Texas and I got about five minutes in and I thought I was going to fall over and die. So um, here we are. This is my kids' playroom and um, this is my sacred space this morning. And I hope that wherever you are in your home or if you're outside, God be with you, um, that it is a sacred space for you as well. That through the power of the Holy Spirit, we might feel united though we are apart. I'm really grateful to Pastor Leanne for this opportunity to preach, to serve the church in this way. This church has been such healing balm for my soul for so long that I am grateful for any opportunity to serve in any way that I can. So I confess that I'm not good at being hot and being outside. Um, another thing that I sort of want to confess to y'all is that I'm not okay. Like, I'm just really stressed out all the time. I'm super agitated, especially when things don't go quite my way, um, when things are just not normal, when things feel like they're just too stressful to handle, like, you know, the last several months. Um, and I'm just not okay. And I keep forgetting why I'm not okay. Like, Every single morning I wake up and I go to my partner and I say, I didn't sleep again. I'm really stressed out. Um, I'm just kind of not feeling great. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Could you help me figure out what's going on? And he looks at me with the most gracious eyes I've ever seen in my life. And he says, just so gently, um, hey, like maybe do you think, just maybe, just throw it out. It could be because we're like in a global pandemic um, and you know, there's like social unrest. Like maybe, do you think that that's why you're not feeling so good? And then I remember like, oh yes, that could be why I feel like the world's on fire. Oh, cause it is. So I want you to know that wherever you are right now, if you're not feeling okay, it's okay. Like we're not supposed to feel okay when we're living in this apocalyptic hellscape. We're just not supposed to be okay. And okay, maybe it's not as bad as an apocalyptic hellscape, but like things are just really, really hard right now. And I feel like I'm supposed to be optimistic or I'm supposed to put on a happy face and just like cheer us along, but I can't. I just can't do it because I'm not okay. And if I talk to you, I'm going to remind you that you're not okay. And it's okay that we're not okay. And some people might think that that's me being vulnerable, but it's not like I'm not being vulnerable. I'm just being tired. I put on makeup this morning for the first time and I don't even know how long. And I went outside and I sweated it all off. So that was like my only filter that I had for today. And now it's gone. Um, so here we are tired and stressed out and overwhelmed and unsure and angry and not okay, but we're together. We're together in it. So things have been crazy lately, like not normal in any way, just undeniably abnormal. And we've been spending so much time with our families. Um, and some of it's great and some of it is just crazy making. Like sometimes mama just needs a little break to hide in her closet. Just sometimes. And then we have days, you know, like this weekend where we celebrate a holiday and we have expectations that go a certain way and it's not going to because we're in a pandemic. So here we are, another pandemic holiday. And this weekend we celebrate 4th of July where as a country we collectively remember that on July 4th, 1776, the Continental Congress formally adopts the Declaration of Independence. 
Now that independence is from British oppression, but it certainly was not liberty for all people in America. I mean, in the Declaration of Independence itself, in the actual document, it calls indigenous people, my people, merciless Indian savages. And we just celebrated Juneteenth together, and for many of us, that was the first time we celebrated that holiday, which marked freedom for our black siblings, enslaved human beings. They were not set free by the Declaration of Independence. So July 4th, 1776 did not mark independence for everyone, not by a long shot. So here we are in 2020 and we turn on the news and we see our black siblings still fighting for freedom, still fighting for this basic right to be black in public without the fear of violence. This basic right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness without someone perceiving their black bodies as a threat. See, even in some places in America, indigenous women are murdered at 10 times the rate of the national average. 84% of native women experience violence in their lifetime. This is a crisis that so many people aren't even aware of. To be a woman, to be queer, to be a black person, to be an indigenous person, to be a person of color, to be a person a part of any marginalized group in America is to live in a different America, to live in a different reality. We look at the COVID numbers and we can see the ingrained systemic inequality in this country in terms of increased risk of getting COVID-19 or experiencing severe illness, regardless of age. Indigenous people have a rate five times greater than a non-Hispanic white person. Non-Hispanic black people also have a rate of approximately five times greater than non-Hispanic white people. Hispanic or Latinx people have a rate approximately four times greater than non-Hispanic people. In Dineta, the Navajo Nation, it's home to 175,000 people. As of June 9th, they had a coronavirus infection rate of 3.4%, more than 6,000 infections. Just to put that into perspective, New York State had an infection rate of 1.9%. See, these numbers, they tell us a story that is older than the Declaration of Independence. A country that is built on the genocide of indigenous people and gains wealth through chattel slavery. Africans ripped from their land, robbed of their children, their culture, their language, their religion. And still the blood of black families are crying from the ground of a nation that still refuses to say black lives matter. And in 2020, we see the horrors of these atrocities play out day in and day out. A system that was created for oppression and ruin is finally beginning to crumble little by little, as people who have been suffocated for far too long and their allies take to the street and they demand justice. Now, I have to confess that as an indigenous woman with my very pale skin and my relentless freckles and my green eyes, I have extraordinary privilege. I can walk in and out of anywhere with little notice. It's something that I do not take for granted, but it took me a long time to figure out. And I think that that's why the work that we're doing as a church to be anti-racist, to look within ourselves and start dismantling these biases that we have and the internalized racism that we have, it has so much value. Not only in the way that we follow Jesus, but also in the way that we love our neighbors. There is a confession and pardon section in a communion liturgy that has sort of been rattling around my brain lately. It says this, Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law and we have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
See, this liturgy runs through my mind over and over, and I find myself repeating it in those hours of the night that I cannot sleep. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not loved our neighbors. We have forgotten the good news that Jesus calls us to proclaim. We have forgotten and we have failed to use our power and our privilege to dismantle systems of oppression. Y'all know that I really love Jesus. Like, this is the part where I, I talk about Jesus. I really, really love Jesus. I love the way that he's always about some sort of work that's going to get him and his friends killed. I love that he's always up to some sort of shenanigan and he has the saltiest comebacks for the people that are in charge. Those zingers that leave jaws just drop to the floor. And sometimes we don't realize what Jesus is saying because it's so steeped in a culture and a context that isn't ours. We just miss the importance of it. This morning, I want to spend some time in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, or chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. I want to unpack the good news according to Jesus. The Gospel writer has just talked about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness and tells us, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue as he normally did, and he stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him a scroll from the prophet Isaiah, and he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and he sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him, and he began to explain to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled, just as you heard it. Now, this is a mic drop moment, if there ever was one, and I am super here for it. Jesus doesn't even finish reading the scripture. He rolls up the scroll, and in doing so, he ends the service right there. Jesus is saying so much here. Not only is he saying that he is a part of this long line of prophets called by God to sort of course correct the people, saying that he's anointed by God, but he's also saying that the prophecy he came to deliver is being fulfilled in him right now. Jesus, the enfleshment of God, the savior of humanity, but also the prophet who ushers this kingdom of God in. The good news, the gospel, is Jesus' proclamation of emancipation. Oh, and because it's coming from Jesus, it smacks of grace and defiance. Because the recipients of the good news are granted this liberty regardless of their religious standing and regardless of their national allegiance. Are you catching how political this is? See, that's sort of the MO of the prophets. They speak truth to power, letting them know what, what they're doing is wrong. That's why the prophets are super unpopular. This is why Jesus is crucified, because power doesn't like to be critiqued. Jesus, the prophet, isn't as palatable as we would like him to be. And Jesus goes further than the prophets because he's actually bringing the kingdom in himself. See, this isn't like our Declaration of Independence. This is truly freedom for everyone, and not just freedom. Jesus is talking about restoration, a proclamation of the year of the Lord's favor. It's a time of jubilee where all debts are forgiven, where slaves are set free, and land is returned to its original owners. So in this country, when we talk about reparation and land back, it's far less political and far more biblical than we have ever imagined. The coming of redemption, the good news to the poor is re-enfranchisement. Where the system that has been built by forcibly taking land and devastating it, an accumulation of wealth has been built through the enslavement of sacred human beings, is dismantled. 
a new system is built, but not by those who hold power, but by those who have been marginalized, where the land is restored and taken care of in the right way, where equality is actualized. This is the good news according to Jesus. See, Jesus isn't just preaching the gospel. He is bringing it, the kingdom of God ushered in by Christ himself. And church, Jesus calls us to do this exact work. This is the good news. This is the work of the community to break down systems that have torn us apart for far too long. Does this sound familiar to you? When we say black lives matter, we are proclaiming the kingdom of God and we are working towards liberation. When we hold the door open and we use our voices, our platforms, and our bodies to crank up the volume on the voices of black people, indigenous people, and people of color, we are joining Christ's work of ushering in that kingdom of God. See, this is the work of following Christ. It, it isn't solely about a personal relationship, but it's wildly communal. It's about our relationship with each other. It's about our relationship with power. It's about our relationship with the oppressor, and whether that's a person or a system, it doesn't matter. And one way we engage this work is to listen. It isn't about giving a voice to the voiceless, as the popular trope suggests. It's doing the work of quieting ourselves and listening to the voices that are screaming at the top of their lungs, and we have been ignoring them for far too long. Our country is so divided and so broken right now that folks become so defensive before they truly even listen. Where we're quick to say, that's not me. I didn't do that. Or what about my history? Instead, and at the very least, and for the sake of Christ and the gospel, we should be listening to those that are hurting before we make a list of all the reasons why this isn't our fault. And if I can, church, take a moment of liberty to tell you something that is deeply personal to me. There is one America that is so very concerned about preserving monuments and statues, about not forgetting a history that is so deeply ingrained in Black and Indigenous people, it's encoded in our DNA. Trauma that is generational and it lives inside of our bodies. How could we forget? We will not forget this history. I don't sit with my cousins at a park and reminisce about our land and our language and our religion forcibly taken away from us while whimsically looking up at a statue of Andrew Jackson or Christopher Columbus and think, thank God the statue is here or else I would have forgotten our history. See, I don't want to speak for other groups, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that my guess is black folks don't need a statue of a slave master to be reminded of their history in this country. Those tyrannical, genocidal monsters do not need to be memorialized by statues for us to remember the horror they inflicted on our families. We have got to learn to listen to our siblings. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim the release to the prisoners, recovery of slight, sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We are supposed to be working, co-laboring with Christ to build the kingdom of God that Jesus has already ushered in. It is here and it is in our midst midst. Our black siblings have been doing work for so long. They have been working so hard to get every one of us to see how we are a part of these oppressive systems. They have even given us a way to release ourselves from these systems. So my prayer for us is to truly internalize that call from Christ, not only to share the good news, but to engage in the work of that kingdom building for us to steal ourselves because this work isn't easy. Justice will always require sacrifice. 
a laying down of our privilege, a sacred determination to listen with our entire selves, even when and especially when it requires us to change something that we hold valuable. We do this in order to be a part of creating something new. So now, may the courage of Christ, our liberator, fill you. May the fire of the Holy Spirit burn in your belly and the creativity of our God who creates inspire you to work until life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is a guaranteed right to all Americans. May you be blessed, and may peace be with you, dear ones. Amen.